Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace and peace of God be with you all in his holy church. And also with you. Today our cathedral celebrates the first century of its consecrated life. It's my great honor and privilege to welcome Your Eminence Cardinal O'Connor to St. Patrick's Cathedral, Melbourne, for this historic occasion. I welcome also to the Cathedral Cardinal Clancy, Archbishop of Sydney and President of the Australian Bishops' Conference, Cardinal Ferno, Grand Master of the Order of the Holy Sepulchre, His Excellency Archbishop Brambilla, Apostolic Pro Nuncio in Australia, Archbishop Little, our own Emeritus Archbishop, Archbishops and Bishops of Australia, the members of the Papal Mission, Monsignors Walsh and Cudmore, my fellow priests of the Archdiocese and priests of religious congregations, and members of religious institutes, heads and representatives of Christian churches and of other faiths. faiths. I'm honoured and privileged to welcome His Excellency Sir James Gobbo, Governor of Victoria and Lady Gobbo. His Excellency Mr Richard O'Brien, Ambassador of Ireland, representatives of federal and state parliaments, the Lord Mayor of Melbourne and Mrs Deverson, representatives of the Diplomatic Corps, members of centenary committees, and distinguished guests and dear friends. At the opening of the cathedral in 1897, the remark was made how diverse the congregation was. There were people from different parts of the country, from overseas, and from all walks of life. The same is true this evening. It's marvelous to see you all here to celebrate the centenary of St. Patrick's and to share in the massive dedication of the new altar in our beautifully restored cathedral. I wish to pay tribute to Archbishop Little, who initiated the conservation and restoration works and to Archbishop Pell, who completed them. I wish also to pay tribute to all who supported the work with their gifts, and to those who worked on this project in committees and elsewhere, under the leadership of Mr John Relf, Mr Ed Ryan, Mr Tony Salman, and Father O'Reilly. Finally, I pay tribute to the Centenary Office and its staff, and its three executive officers, Mr. Vincent Arthur, Mrs. Kath Ellison, and Mrs. Jean Cornish. As the banners that line the streets around the cathedral say, let this place now resound with joy. My brothers and sisters in Christ, this is a day of rejoicing We've come together to dedicate this altar by offering the sacrifice of Christ. May we respond to these holy rites, receive God's word with faith, share at the Lord's table with joy, and raise our hearts in hope. Gathered around this one altar, we draw nearer to Christ, the living stone, in whom we become God's holy temple. But first let us ask God to bless this gift of water as it is sprinkled upon us and upon this altar. May it be a sign of our repentance and a reminder of our baptism. God of mercy, you call every creature to the light of life and surround us with such great love that when we stray, you continually lead us back to Christ our head. For you have established an inheritance of such mercy that those sinners who pass through water made sacred die with Christ to rise restored as members of his body 
and heirs of his eternal covenant. Bless this water, sanctify it, as it is sprinkled upon us and upon this altar, make it a sign of the saving waters of baptism by which we become one in Christ, the temple of your spirit. May all here today and those in days to come who will celebrate your mysteries on this altar be united at last in the holy city of your peace. We ask this in the name of Jesus, the Lord. Two steps. And may God, the Father of mercies, to whom we dedicate this altar on earth, forgive us our sins and enable us to offer an unending sacrifice of praise on his altar in heaven.
the highest and peace to his people on earth. Glory, glory, glory to God in the highest and the peace to his people on earth. Let us pray. Lord, you willed that all things be drawn to your Son, mounted on the altar of the cross. Bless those who dedicate this altar to your service. May it be the table of our unity, a banquet of plenty, and a source of the Spirit, in whom we grow daily as your faithful people. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the book of Genesis. When Jacob had reached a certain place, he passed the night there. 
since the sun had set. Taking one of the stones to be found at that place, he made it his pillow and lay down where he was. He had a dream. A ladder was there, standing on the ground with its top reaching to heaven. And there were angels of God going up it and coming down. And the Lord was there, standing over him, saying, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. I will give to your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the specks of dust on the ground. You shall spread to the west and the east, to the north and the south, and all the tribes of the earth shall bless themselves by you and your descendants. Be sure that I am with you. I will keep you safe wherever you go and bring you back to this land. For I will not desert you before I have done all that I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Truly, the Lord is in this place, and I never knew it. He was afraid and said, how awe-inspiring is this place. This is nothing less than a house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Rising early in the morning, Jacob took the stone he had used for his pillow and set it up as a monument pouring oil over the top of it. This is the word of the Lord. go rejoicing to the house of the Lord. Let us go rejoicing to the house of the Lord. Let us go Let us go to God's house. And now feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Let us go rejoicing to the house of the Lord. Jerusalem is built as
as a city strongly compact. It is there that the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord. Let us go rejoicing to the house of the Lord. Let us go the Lord's name. There were set the thrones of judgment of the house of David. Let us go rejoicing to the house of the Jerusalem pray peace be to your homes may peace reign in your walls on your palaces peace let us go rejoicing to the house of the Lord let us Brethren and friends, I say peace upon you. For love of the house of the Lord, I will ask for your good. Let us go rejoicing to the house of the Lord. Let us go. A reading from the first letter of St. Peter. Jesus Christ is the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. Set yourselves close to him so that you too, the holy priesthood that offers the, the spiritual sacrifices which Jesus Christ has made acceptable to God, may be living stones making a spiritual house. As scripture says, see how I, lie, how I lay in Zion a precious cornerstone that I have chosen, and the man who rests his trust on it will not be disappointed. That means that for you who are believers, it is precious, but for unbelievers, the stone rejected by the builders has proved to be the keystone, a stone to stumble over, a rock to bring men down. They stumble over it because they do not believe in the word. It was the fate in store for them. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a consecrated nation, a people set apart to sing the praises of God who called you out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. This is the word of the Lord.
chosen and sanctified this house, says the Lord, that my name may remain in it for all time. Alleluia. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he put this question to his disciples. Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say he is John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But you, he said, who do you say I am? Then Simon Peter spoke up. You are the Christ, he said, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Simon, son of Jonah, you are a happy man because it was not flesh and blood that revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. So I now say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of the underworld can never hold out against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be considered bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be considered loosed in heaven. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. Jesus Christ. the Dean of the Cathedral was gracious enough to welcome all of you, to single you out by office and to pay appropriate deference. I will not therefore attempt to do that, but simply presume to address you as friends. And anyway, I have no authority to welcome you to this cathedral, it's not my cathedral and Archbishop Pell is extremely sensitive about such matters.
I don't know if you realize how far you live from New York. I have been forever getting here, but I'm highly privileged to be here. Some of you, perhaps, have not had opportunity to visit this magnificent cathedral since its truly, truly beautiful restoration. I would imagine you would want to express your gratitude to Archbishop Bell's predecessor, who initiated and carried through much of this restoration, Archbishop Little. But Archbishop Pell, it is your responsibility now, and therefore I want to tell you that in my report to our Holy Father about this visit, I will tell him how you tried to kill me on those steps. <laughs> the steps in St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York are much higher, but they are not deceptive to visitors. <laughs> Incidentally, not all of you would realize this, but I'm doing the most dangerous thing that any bishop can do, turn his back toward his brother bishops. It's even worse in New York, where any one of them could succeed me. <laughs> it is a truly profound privilege for me, but a deeply humbling privilege to be appointed by our Holy Father as his extraordinary envoy on this very, very special occasion. I will read his message shortly, but you will for, perhaps forgive my expression of personal sentiment. I think that this Holy Father, whom I say without embarrassment, I love so very deeply and reverence beyond measure has been an extraordinary gift to the church, perhaps one of the greatest treasures in the history of the church. And it And it is therefore particularly humbling for me to try to represent him, however unworthily. The dedication of this magnificent cathedral 100 years ago to the day was presided over by His Eminence, Cardinal Moran, the Archbishop of Sydney, a predecessor to my friend Cardinal Clancy, Cardinal Clancy and I are on a commission together in Rome that counts the Holy See's money. It doesn't take us very long. <laughs> but when Cardinal Moran dedicated this cathedral, or rather when he presided at the dedication, he preached for three hours. I promise not to exceed him by a great deal. I do not know, I can only guess, that our Holy Father designated me to represent him here because as Archbishop Pell, I too am the pastor of a great cathedral of St. Patrick, not the mother cathedral of Armagh, 
but the Cathedral of St. Patrick in New York. Both the Cathedral in New York and this St. Patrick were built when Catholics were few and were really among the poorest of the poor. As I recall studying the history, there were only 77,000 Catholics in the state of Victoria. When Cardinal Gould envisioned and launched upon the creation of this cathedral. A later Archbishop, your own Archbishop Thomas Joseph Carr, at its consecration, called this great edifice, and I use the word that he used, a magnificent cathedral. And New York's Archbishop John Hughes said precisely in envisioning St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York, that he wanted to build a cathedral of suitable magnificence. That took tremendous vision. The one in New York was called by skeptics, Hughes Folly. Both of our archdioceses have had a wonderful series of bishops. Your own Archbishop, George Pell, following Archbishop Little, well before him, the famous Archbishop Mannix and others in between and prior to Archbishop Mannix, Archbishop Pell continues the tradition of great bishops. And there we differ. Many New Yorkers believe that our great archbishops ended with my immediate predecessor, Cardinal Cook. In fact, the great American church historian, Monsignor John Tracy Ellis, told me personally and very straightforwardly at my own dinner table that Archbishop Hughes was the greatest archbishop New York ever will have had. <laughs> Try that on your humility. There are other reasons, however, for which our Holy Father could have perhaps appointed me as his extraordinary envoy, but I don't think he'd be aware of these reasons first. For example, that I came through Australia once before while a chaplain with the United States Navy and Marine Corps en route to the wondrous Antarctic to commune with the penguins. I found each to be a unique creation of Almighty God and a reflection of his great glory Secondly, I served in Vietnam with the intrepid, the truly courageous forces of your country, Australia, who had a superb reputation. But perhaps most significantly, I was chaplain of the only United States ship ever named after the capital of a country outside the United States the USS Canberra guided missile cruiser, named after your capital because of your country's vital role in the Battle of the Coral Sea in which your own Canberra was lost. Not insignificantly while serving in Canberra and therefore coming in touch with Australians quite frequently, I learned songs such as Waltzing Matilda, and have tried to forget others that I shouldn't have learned in the first place. <laughs> now permit me to read a portion of our Holy Father's message. Normally on an occasion like this, the extraordinary envoy would read the entire message, but it has been printed in this very beautiful booklet for the Mass for the centenary that all of you have received. So I want to read but one thing that the Holy Father had to say. It's toward the conclusion of the message in the English translation that I had made since it was given to me in Latin. We pray that the Holy Spirit may dwell as in a temple in the church and in the hearts of the faithful in order that the church in Australia may be ever youthful and constantly renewed. 
Our Holy Father's entire message, of course, is filled with meaning. But I want to reflect on this particular passage. I repeat, we pray that the Holy Spirit may dwell as in a temple in the church and in the hearts of the faithful, in order that the church in Australia may be ever youthful and constantly renewed, ever youthful and constantly renewed. The great G.K. Chesterton said that the wonderful thing about the church is that she is not simply 1900 years old, but that she's 1900 years new. We Catholics believe this is so because we believe the church is the living body of Christ, that we are the living stones, as St. Paul says, the living members of his body of which he is the head, that his heart beats within us, his spirit vibrates and pulsates and breathes within us and through us. And we believe that this same Christ, the Son of God, is here with us in his Eucharistic presence, that in this holy sacrifice of the Mass, a piece of bread will actually become his sacred body. A cup of wine will truly become his most precious blood. Not won't particularly look like his body, the wine won't look like his blood, but it really becomes his body, becomes his blood. It's in this, in his Eucharistic presence, that we have the fountain of life and of eternal youth and renewal, which our Holy Father hopes for us. We truly believe that not only will we receive him in Holy Communion, but that he will receive us, in a sense, divinize us, as St. Thomas would have it. We who are many become one because he incorporates us into himself so that all our differences are absorbed in his oneness. It is in this holy sacrifice of the Mass, then, this mysterious spiritual reincarnation of the birth and crucifixion and resurrection of Christ in which all the power of Calvary is again unleashed. In this Mass, the source of the Eucharist, we are truly made young and renewed. This great cathedral then is not simply 100 years old, but 100 years new. This is indeed one of the great reasons for the existence of a cathedral, to serve as his Eucharistic dwelling place. But there's another of immense importance. A cathedral, as many of you are aware, is so-called because it houses the seat, the cathedra in Latin from or in the presence of which the bishop preaches the word of God as taught by Christ, the word who became flesh, as St. John tells us, and dwells among us. As we receive the living Lord in Holy Communion, so we receive the same living Lord from the lips of the bishop, once again making us young and renewed with Christ's own life and vigor. I know that our Holy Father would want me to thank Archbishop George Pell publicly in a special way for the fidelity and vigor with which he transmits that church teaching, which we believe to be revealed through Christ, the living word in the Holy Spirit. I'm sure you know better than I. I am sure you know better than I that throughout your country, you are a fortunate people in your bishops. Today's gospel makes clear that Christ is not a Lord of compromise, ambiguities, or equivocations.
who do you say that I am? He asks every Christian. As he asked his immediate followers, who do you say that I am? And they tried to dissemble. Perhaps they shuffled their feet. They shook their heads. They didn't want to look at him. They heard what he asked, but they answered, some people say this and some people say that. He said, no. Who do you say that I am? Not who does the world say that I am? The media, the philosophers or psychologists or nuclear physicists or the government or the university or the man or woman next door. Who do you say personally, individually? Who do you say from your heart, from your mind, not simply from your lips? Who do you say that I am? Peter gave the answer that the church continues to give through the centuries. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. This was not the answer of the world. As our Lord said, flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And you, Peter, the rock have the keys of the kingdom. We believe everything flows from this in our Catholic teaching. Everything flows from this without compromise or ambiguity or equivocation. For example, the sacredness and worth of every human person from the instant of conception to the moment of death with abortion and euthanasia or what is now called physician-assisted suicide both abhorrent because every human person is fashioned in the image of that same Christ, the son of the living God, and is therefore sacred and inviolable. And yet by that same teaching, the church never condemns a poor woman who misled, fearful, has had an abortion, the merciful Christ urges us, rather, to help her pick up the pieces of her life and return to his forgiving love. This is the truth in all things, not just in regard to human life. This is the truth in all things, taught by your archbishop and by each of his six predecessors who have vigorously and courageously taught that the truth alone sets us free. They have given short shrift to the relativism that sees no difference between right and wrong. With the English essayist Coventry Patmore, they would say, it will not do to let falsehood say to truth, I will tolerate you if you will tolerate me. The most powerful solvent is the strongest opposite. You can best move this world by making it clear that you stand upon another. How critical is this commitment of your bishops to truth in a world caught up in what our Holy Father has called, with great sadness, the culture of death. Nor is the teaching of truth ever an impediment to those constructive ecumenical and interfaith activities to which this archdiocese has demonstrated it is sincerely committed. Indeed, it is the honest articulation of truth as we understand it that makes it possible for Muslims and Jews and Buddhists, Protestants and Catholics and others of goodwill to converse together and work together for the good of all. It is the truth that sets us free not merely to tolerate, but to love one another. May I turn now briefly to what our Holy Father singles out in his message, what we might well consider the centerpiece of this evening's ceremony, the consecration of this magnificent new altar. I would like to focus on the relics that will be placed in the altar. They are particularly meaningful to Australia. Oliver Plunkett, to honor the Irish origins of the Catholic Church in Australia, 
Peter Chanel, the first martyr of Oceania, Thomas Tien, seminarian and one of the Vietnamese martyrs in honor of the vibrant Vietnamese community in Melbourne, Anthony of Padua, chosen to honor the largely European origins of Melbourne Catholics, Thérèse of Lisieux, patroness of the missions and especially venerated in Australia, very recently declared a doctor of the church, only the third among women, the 37th of all of those in the 2000 year history of the church to be declared doctor. And finally, St. Francis Xavier, co-patron of the missions, honoring the fact that Australia was under what we now call the Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples until 1976. What did all these have in common besides the faith itself, sacrifice and suffering? If we fail to reflect upon so obvious and meaningful a lesson, even briefly, this occasion could be purely, purely ceremonial. Every one of us here, and forget, forgive now please, my being very personal, but every one of us here, and all those who have gone before us, are united in the same language of suffering and sacrifice as that of the saints whose relics will be placed here, the suffering of the crucified Christ himself. We're not martyrs, any of us here, although for some, in the circumstances of their lives, each day can be a living martyrdom. Our sufferings and sacrifices may be unknown except to God and to ourselves and offer little to the world in the way of drama. Surely, someone here is a widow or a widower who has known the suffering of loneliness perhaps still does so. Someone here almost certainly is afflicted with cancer or another dread disease, perhaps AIDS. Some live in lonely or difficult or empty marriages. Some bear the scars of a divorce. Perhaps someone here may have lost a child to drugs or suicide. Someone may have a daughter who has gone through the tragedy of an abortion. Someone here feels alienated and rejected even by the church. Someone struggles, I'm sure, with a tremendously difficult moral temptation that seems overpowering. Why reflect on suffering and sacrifice on such a, a joyful occasion, the anniversary of a great cathedral and the consecration of a new altar? It seems to me that this is the perfect time to do so. If we use the occasion to remind ourselves that the greatest tragedy, as it would have been for those whose relics will be placed in this altar, the greatest tragedy is not pain or sacrifice or suffering itself. The greatest tragedy is wasted pain, wasted sacrifice, wasted suffering. Our Lord did not make possible the salvation of the world through his preaching, however magnificent, his teaching, however eloquent, his miracles, however spectacular. Christ made possible your salvation and mine by his suffering and death on the cross. The great tragedy is to be unaware of or indifferent to the potential of our daily sufferings the little ones, the great ones, mental, moral, emotional, physical. To be unaware of the fact that we can unite that suffering, however trivial it may seem, a passing headache to the suffering and death of Christ on the cross and help continue the salvation of souls as well as to bring down great graces on the world. There may be someone at this moment in my own archdiocese in New York on the verge of suicide, who will receive the grace to pull back from self-destruction because someone here offers a headache or a backache or a heartache in union with the suffering of Christ on the cross. It doesn't make the suffering easier. 
It makes it meaningful. Was it by chance that our Lord cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? How else could he show us that it was when he seemed utterly powerless that he was most powerful? And how else could he show us that when we seem completely powerless in our physical or mental or emotion or moral suffering, uniting our powerlessness with his gives us enormous power for good. These aren't mere words. I believe them so passionately that at the risk of seeming presumptuous, I can say with deep sincerity that I would have come here from New York simply to say these words to one suffering soul because I believe they can change our lives. Again, they don't make suffering the slightest bit easier, but they can make it tremendously meaningful. I dwell on this particularly because of one of the relics placed in the altar this evening, that of St. Therese of Lisieux. Permit me to seem to digress for but a moment, because this is a woman called the little flower, so often depicted sentimentally as a picture postcard, looking ever so lovely with an unlined face and a beautifully taken care of have it. This was a woman who suffered almost mercilessly. Many of us were invited to write to our Holy Father at the time of the possibility of declaring her a doctor of the church because in addition to saintly virtue, someone to be declared a doctor of the church must have explored and revealed some new theological understandings. I wrote to our Holy Father that in my judgment, this is a woman who plumbed the depths of suffering, not sweetly and sentimentally and serenely as she so often depicted, but with horrible anguish, often feeling herself completely abandoned by God as Christ himself on the cross, thinking she was losing her faith thinking that despite all of the sacrifices that she had lived as a Carmelite nun, she would lose her soul. But she united all of this with the sufferings of Christ on the cross. And this is what makes her a great saint, and in my judgment, a doctor of the church. Because I know that one of the missionary sisters of charity read so beautifully, might I just add, in honor of that Mother Teresa of Calcutta, whom all of us loved deeply, whom I had the honor to call an intimate personal friend. The day that I went up the high altar in the Basilica in Rome to have our Holy Father impose his hands his strong Polish hands on my head. When I came down the steps of that altar, I saw a woman virtually pressing herself into the stone wall in self-effacement. I recognized her instantly as Mother Teresa. I knew that she wouldn't know me, but I broke the line and went over to her. And without knowing me, she looked in my eyes and said to this new bishop, give God permission. Give God permission. Let him reach out to others who are suffering with your hands. Let him speak gently and mercifully and lovingly to others through your lips. Let others look into your eyes and have their sufferings relieved. See his gentle love washing away all their sins. Give God permission. May I conclude simply by citing from Archbishop Pell's powerful homily on the occasion of completing the renovation 
of this magnificent cathedral, the renovation initiated by Archbishop Little. And I quote, it was faith that shaped these stones and faith which inspired the generosity and dedication for the restoration. Neither money nor history nor legitimate community pride can replace the spirit of truth, Archbishop Pell said. But he continued, if the time ever comes, and may God forbid this, that the flame of faith vanishes in our community, then these stones will fall silent and the spirit of truth will disappear to await recall. I don't pretend to know your country or even the church in your country, but from what little I have seen, there is no danger that the flame of faith will vanish. There's no danger that these stones will fall silent or that the spirit of truth will disappear to await recall. Your faith is clearly too vibrant and vital and dynamic. The great architect of this cathedral, William Wilkinson Wardell, adopted as his motto at the time of his reception into the Catholic Church in London, I have found that which I sought. I have found that which I sought. May it be through the intercession of the great St. Patrick, through the intercession, intercession of those whose relics will be inserted into this new altar, and in a very special way through the intercession of Mary, our Blessed Mother, patroness of Australia. May it be that all who enter this magnificent cathedral through years to come will likewise find that which they have sought. I thank you. I love you. God bless you.
Let our prayers go forth to God the Father through Jesus Christ, his Son, with whom are joined all the saints who have shared in his suffering and now sit at his table of glory. Let us kneel. and St. John, pray for us. St. Mary Magdalene, pray for us. All you holy apostles, pray for us. St. Stephen and St. Lawrence, pray for us. St. Lucy and St. Agnes, Pray for us, all you holy deacons and martyrs. Pray for us. 
Saint Gregory and Saint Augustine, pray for us. Saint Basil and Saint Teresa, pray for us. Saint Patrick and Saint Bridget, pray for us. Saint Cecilia and Saint Benedict, pray for us. Saint Francis and Saint Clare, pray for us. Saint Dominic and Saint Catherine, pray for us. Saint Oliver Plunkett, pray for us. Saint Peter Chanel, pray for us. Saint Thomas Tien, pray for us. Saint Anthony of Padua, pray for us. Saint Therese of Lisieux, pray for us. Saint Francis Xavier, pray for us. Blessed Peter Torot, pray for us. Blessed Catherine Macaulay, pray for us. Blessed Frederick Ozenham, pray for us. Blessed Edmund Rice, pray for us. Blessed Mary McKillop, pray for us. All holy men and women, pray for us. God here among us, show us your mercy. Stay with your people, come to our help. God here among us, show us your mercy. Stay with your people, come to our help. Lord, be merciful. Lord, save your people from all evil. Lord, save your people from everlasting death. Lord, save your by your coming in our flesh. Lord, save your people by your death and resurrection. Lord, save your people by your sending of the Spirit. Lord, save your people. God, hear among us, show us your mercy. Stay with your people, come to our help. God, hear among us, show us your mercy. Stay with your people, come to our help. Be merciful to us sinners. Lord, hear our prayer. Guide and protect your church. Lord, hear our prayer, keep our Pope in faithful service. Lord, hear our prayer, may your ministers serve your church. Lord, hear our prayer, bring all people together. Lord, hear our prayer, strengthen us in your service. Lord, hear our prayer. Make this altar holy. Lord, hear our prayer. Consecrate it for your worship. Lord, hear our prayer. Jesus, Son of the living God. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear us. Lord, Jesus, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, hear our prayer. 
God, hear among us, show us your mercy. Stay with your people, come to our help. God, hear among us, show us your mercy. Stay with your people, come to our help. Lord, may the prayers of the Blessed Virgin Mary and of all the saints make our prayers acceptable to you. May this altar be the place where the great mysteries of redemption are accomplished, a place where your people offer their gifts, unfold their good intentions, pour out their prayers, and echo every meaning of their faith and devotion. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Let us stand. Deacon has brought a cask with the relics in it that I've already cited. I will now place these in the inset in the altar, and then those will be sealed.
this is the actual prayer of dedication of the altar. It's a very beautiful prayer. It goes back into the Old Testament or the Jewish scriptures. It speaks of the various dedications and uses of altars by the priests and prophets of the Old Testament, and then what the purpose of this particular altar will be. Father, we praise you and give you thanks for you have established the sacrament of true worship by bringing to perfection in Christ the mystery of the one true altar prefigured in those many altars of old. Noah, the second father of the human race, once the waters fell and the mountains peaked again, built an altar in your name. You, Lord, were appeased by his fragrant offering, and your rainbow bore witness to a covenant refounded in love. Abraham, our father in faith, wholeheartedly accepted your word and consecrated an altar on which to slay Isaac, his only son. But you, Lord, stayed his hand and provided a ram for his offering. Moses, mediator of the law, built an altar on which was cast the blood of a lamb, so prefiguring the altar of the cross. All this Christ has fulfilled in the Paschal mystery. As priest and victim, he freely mounted the tree of the cross and gave himself to you, Father, as the one perfect oblation. In his sacrifice, the covenant is sealed in his blood, sin is engulfed. Lord, we therefore stand before you in prayer. Bless this altar built in the house of the church, that it may ever be reserved for the sacrifice of Christ, and stand forever as the Lord's table, where your people will find nourishment and strength. May this altar, a sign of Christ, from whose pierced side flowed blood and water, which ushered in the sacraments of the church, make it a table of joy where the friends of Christ may hasten to cast upon you their burdens and cares and take up their journey restored. Make it a place of communion and peace so that those who share the body and blood of your Son may be filled with his Spirit and grow in your life of love. Make it a source of unity and friendship where your people may gather as one to share your spirit of mutual love. Make it the center of our praise and thanksgiving until we arrive at the eternal tabernacle where together with Christ, high priest and living altar, we will offer you an everlasting sacrifice of praise. We ask this to our Lord Jesus Christ, your son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Any of the bishops here I think could tell you that this is almost a mystical experience for a bishop to anoint the altar. We pour these consecrated oils, consecrated in this cathedral, into five spots, each marked by a cross. These symbolize the five wounds in the side, the feet, and the hands of Christ. And then the altar the bishop spreads with his hands the oil the bishop spreads, spreads with his hands over the entire altar. He is reminded that when Christ was taken down from the cross, we're told that Mary and the other women went to anoint his body. It's as though the centuries disappear and we are back at that tomb of Christ. But also we know that Christ dies again, but rises again in this holy sacrifice of the Mass, and that once again we are immediately in his presence. So we now anoint this altar. May God in his power make it holy, 
a visible sign of the mystery of Christ who offered himself for the life of the world. Incense was used throughout the Old Testament period when the animals were sacrificed and the incense changed this into a, a sweet odor. For us, it is primarily that the smoke of the incense wafts up toward the heavens. Our prayers go up with the incense. Lord, may our prayer ascend as incense in your sight. As this building is filled with fragrance, so may your church fill the world with the fragrance of Christ. I have to put incense in here. Hold on.
light of Christ, shine on his altar and be reflected by those who share at this table. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, all powerful and ever living God, we do well always and everywhere to give you thanks through Jesus Christ our Lord. True priest and true victim, he offered himself to you on the altar of the cross and commanded us to celebrate that same sacrifice until he comes again. Therefore, your people have built this altar and have dedicated it to your name with grateful hearts. This is a truly sacred place. Here the sacrifice of Christ is offered in mystery. Perfect praise is given to you, and our redemption is made continually present. Here is prepared the Lord's table at which your children, nourished by the body of Christ, are gathered into a church, one and holy. Here your people drink of the Spirit, the stream of living water flowing from the rock of Christ. They will become in him a worthy offering and a living altar. We praise you, Lord, with all the angels and saints in their song of joy.
We come to you, Father, with praise and thanksgiving through Jesus Christ, your Son. Through him we ask you to accept and bless these gifts we offer you in sacrifice. We offer them for your holy Catholic Church. Watch over it, Lord, and guide it. Grant it peace and unity throughout the world. We offer them for John Paul, our Pope, for myself, your unworthy servant, for George, the bishop of this place, and for all who hold and teach the Catholic faith that comes to us from the apostles. Remember, Lord, your people, especially those for whom we now pray. Remember all of us gathered here before you. You know how firmly we believe in you and dedicate ourselves to you. We offer you this sacrifice of praise for ourselves and those who are dear to us. We pray to you, our living and true God, for our well-being and redemption. In union with the whole Church, we honor Mary, the ever virgin mother of Jesus Christ, our Lord and God. We honor jo Joseph, her husband, the apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon, and Jude. We honor Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John, and Paul, Cosmas, and Damian, and all the saints. May their merit and prayers gain us your constant help and protection. Father, accept this offering from your whole family. Grant us your peace in this life. Save us from final damnation and count us among those you have chosen. Bless and approve our offering. Make it acceptable to you an offering in spirit and in truth. Let it become for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord. The day before he suffered, he took bread in his sacred hands, 
and looking up to heaven to you, his almighty Father. He gave you thanks and praise. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. When supper was ended, he took the cup. Again, he gave you thanks and praise. He gave the cup to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Father, we celebrate the memory of Christ, your Son. We, your people and your ministers, recall his passion, his resurrection from the dead, and his ascension into glory. And from the many gifts you have given us, we offer to you, God of glory and majesty, this holy and perfect sacrifice, the bread of life and the cup of eternal salvation. Look with favor on these offerings, and accept them as once you accepted the gifts of your servant Abel, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in peace, and the bread and wine offered by your priest Melchizedek. Almighty God, we pray that your angel may take this sacrifice to your altar in heaven. Then as we receive from this altar the sacred body and blood of your son, let us be filled with every grace and blessing. Remember, Lord, those who have died and have gone before us, marked with the sign of faith, especially those for whom we now pray. May these and all who sleep in Christ find in your presence light, happiness, and peace. For ourselves, too, we ask some share in the fellowship of your apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all the saints. Though we are sinners, we trust in your mercy and love. Don't consider what we truly deserve, but grant us your forgiveness through Christ our Lord. Through him you give us all these gifts. You fill them with life and goodness. You bless them and make them holy. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, almighty Father, forever and ever.
Let us pray now for the coming of the kingdom as Jesus taught us. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin and protect us from all anxiety as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom, where you live forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. <clears throat> Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Peace to you, dear. Peace to you, friend. Peace to you, man. Grant us peace. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those who are called to his supper. Lord, may we always be drawn to this altar of sacrifice, united in faith and love. May we be nourished by the body of Christ and transformed into his likeness, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. I am sure that I am speaking for everyone here tonight when I say that it has been a privilege to participate in this uh, profound act of community worship. Without doubt it is the high point 
of our centenary year of celebrations, this Eucharist and the blessing and anointing of the new altar by, the, by Cardinal John O'Connor, the envoy of our Holy Father, Pope John Paul II. It is certainly a celebration of 150 years of magnificent achievement. But equally certainly, it is more than that. It is a springboard. It is a sign of our determination with the grace of God and only with the grace of God, our determination to hand on the flame of faith undiminished to the coming generations. Now I'm one of those gospel examples of people who reap where others have sown. Tonight uh, those who have uh, given great leadership in this enterprise of restoration, this giant project have been mentioned. Perhaps the Dean didn't mention himself, but Mr. John Ralph, Mr. Ted Exel, Mr. Ed Ryan, Father O'Reilly, Mrs. Jean Cornish, the many donors, the states and federal governments, lay people, priests and religious. I repeat the thanks of the Church to you all. But I also uh, want to repeat again a special mention made by Cardinal O'Connor. The thanks that are due to the man who had to decide at a time of financial depression, a man who had to decide to launch this, this process. And that is Archbishop Frank Little. Archbishop Little took that decision and he's been magnificently vindicated. To all those involved in preparing the ceremony, the Diocesan Master of Ceremonies, Father Portelli, the servers, the choir, Mr. Alan Steele, Mr. Max Potter, the Dean certainly, all those that I haven't mentioned, a deep expression of thanks. And now a word about the principal celebrant. There have been irregular contacts between the Catholic churches of New York and Melbourne since the days of Dr. Carr, our second archbishop. The most spectacular was the visit of Dr. Mannix to New York around about 1921, when he was given the freedom of the city. I think he was beginning that journey, that voyage across the Atlantic when he was arrested on the high seas by the British Navy and prevented from entering Ireland. He was taken ashore at Penzance, the Pirates of Penzance. The Archbishop opined that it was the greatest British naval victory since the Battle of the Jutland. The voyage had had a rough start uh, in New York itself when the British crew of the liner said that the boat would not sail if Dr. Mannix was a passenger on it. But the Irish-American wharfies had the last say by explaining that the boat certainly would not sail unless Dr. Mannix was a passenger. <laughs> and the boat did sail. Times are quieter now, uh, thanks be to God. 
On Friday, I was speaking to the Pope before I left to return to come to this ceremony. I explained to him that I was leaving a bit early to be here on time. I told him about our loyalty to the successor of Peter. I asked uh, him for his prayers for us now and into the future. And I also said, perhaps mistakenly, because at that stage I didn't think that Cardinal O'Connor uh, would accuse me of attempting to kill him, <laughs> I said to the Holy Father that he couldn't have done us a greater honour than by appointing the Archbishop uh, of New York uh, to come among us and to celebrate this Mass. <laughs> your Eminence, we deeply appreciate uh, your presence. We thank you for your magnificent and encouraging uh, homily. We wish you every good thing every peace, every blessing for the years ahead. Thank you. Archbishop Pell, that's a variation of the story that I had heard about Archbishop Mannix. I had been told by other and perhaps much more truthful Australians, that he walked back. <laughs> and because of the nice things you said, I will say nothing to the Holy Father about your attempts on the life of his envoy, but I shall certainly assure you that you will hear from my insurance carrier when I return. <laughs> now I will Again, thank you. This has been one of the truly great privileges given to me in all of my years as a priest, a bishop, as a cardinal. I am deeply indebted to our Holy Father, to Archbishop Pell, to all of my brother cardinals and bishops here, but in a very special way to you, God's people. You are indeed the living cathedral. I will now ask my brother cardinals, bishops, and all my brother priests on this very special occasion to join in giving you the final blessing of the Mass. Let us bow our heads and pray for God's blessing. May God, who has given us the dignity of a royal priesthood, strengthen us in our holy service and make us worthy to share in his sacrifice Amen. Amen. May he who invites us to the one table and feeds us with the one bread make us one in heart and mind. Amen. May all to whom we proclaim Christ be drawn to him by the example of our love. Amen. As my brother bishops and priests will join me. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. <laughs>